Hi, I'm Randy Simmons, the host for Eye on Arts. Today's show, we're going to visit Keith Cars and his Leaping Trout Gallery, which is right here behind us. Let's go check out Keith's gallery. Oh, welcome! We're inside Keith Carr's Leaping Trout Studio. I've got Keith here with me. Uh, Keith, before we get started, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? A little bit about myself. Uh, I was born uh, in Northern California, in Berkeley, more precisely. I grew up out on the West Coast. Uh, I, at a very young age, exhibited a talent in the arts, and my parents uh, promoted that, purchased art supplies for me. And, that mm -hmm. uh, got me in a fair amount of trouble in grade school, too. I was drawing and sketching when I was supposed to be doing my uh, homework or my studies. But, uh, so I'd go home with a note pinned to my chest, and my mother would say, don't do that again. But I was rarely scolded for such activity. Right, so uh, you pursued <coughs> art in high school then as yes, well? Yes, uh, it wasn't until I became a teenager that I really started applying myself to, mm -hmm. to the fine arts, and uh, I was a, a young entrep entrepreneur. I can't say that properly. Uh, I was selling uh, pieces of driftwood that I painted acrylics on, um, primarily vegetables and fruit. That's how I got started. And then in, uh, I went on to high school, and um, well, let me backtrack. In junior high school, I was in what they call a special art class for those who were mm -hmm. gifted. and. Uh, enjoyed that. We included in the uh, special projects that we did. We uh, designed all of the backdrops and scenery for the prom uh, for the graduating class in junior high school, including batik or the, the dyeing of fabrics. Um, in high school, uh, I had an art teacher who took a, an interest in, in my skills and abilities, and uh, I, that's when I began painting at the mm -hmm. age of 17. Um, and then you went on to college. Uh, so you knew when you left high school that you were interested in art. Yes. And went to college and pursued a degree in... I, I began my uh, college education at a community college and got uh, received an Associate of Arts degree in what was then called commercial art, mm -hmm. uh, now is known as graphic design. and. Uh, took a, a leave of absence from school for a brief period and went on to uh, the university and studied graphic design where I received, at, well I went to school at San Jose State University, received a degree in uh, graphic design with an emphasis on illustration. And now you're here in, in Paducah, Kentucky. Uh, what brings you out to Paducah? Well, of course, the artist relocation program uh, is the re primary reason I'm here. I, perhaps I should say primary. Elaine Spaulding, my wife, uh, is a large part of why I'm here, too. I came here four years ago in January of 2002, and we were engaged at the time to be married. And So I thought, what, uh, what better reason to come than to be with my fiancé at the time and launch into this program. All right, and now you're here with your own studio. H how long has your studio been open? We had our grand opening in November of 2004, so uh, going on two years. Keith, behind this is uh, one of your newest works, and it's still in its primary stage. Um, you, you work from your own photography, I believe. And, That's right. And you've done a lot of nature scenes, and uh, you're working on a series right now that, I, that I'm really interested in, and we'll take a look at that in just a moment. But behind us, you have one of your landscapes, and this is uh, taken from one of your own photographs. That's uh, right. You That's want to tell right. us about your process, about uh, your, the, going from, from the photo to the canvas? Okay. Uh, as you can see, there's a photograph here. I've, I've taken this shot of, uh, about two years ago. And this is a scene out of Honker Bay near Lake Barkley, down at Land Between the Lakes. What I do to uh, reproduce this image onto a larger format is to draw a grid. So for instance, in this case, every square inch may equal every six square inches on a larger scale. Mm -hmm. 
And the reason I do that is to uh, recreate the drawing or the image uh, in, a, in proportion, to, ke to keep the proportions correct. You know, the, the, the limbs are where they fall on the picture here, and then they're reproduced on a larger scale. Now, after, after I've established the grid and I've done a very careful pencil rendering uh, directly on the canvas, then I'll start uh, applying the paint. And when you put this pencil grid in and you're sketching this, you, you probably put some kind of spray fixative down to keep the graphite from mixing in with actually, your paints? Actually, I don't. Mm. And uh, that's rarely the case. Uh, quite often when I'm drawing and I'm resting my hand on the canvas, I'll get uh, gr the graphite on the back of my hand and I'll smudge, I'll leave uh, smudges throughout the painting, but sometimes I'll erase those, sometimes I'll paint over them with the gesso. Okay. And, and a lot of artists will uh, paint the raw canvas with gesso, I use a latex house paint. Right. So you paint in oils? Is that right? Or acrylics? Acrylics. Acrylics, primarily. okay. So there's a quick drying and mm -hmm. you have to move a little quickly. To I like acrylics in that it uh, forces me to work m rapidly mm -hmm. and uh, interesting results happen uh, with, with this rapid drying process. So, right. uh, working faster makes me think less and, and paint more intuitively. Right, so acrylics is, is you know, basically safe, you know, when you talk about the uh, the oil paintings, the fumes, and the chemicals that you have to work with. Uh, your studio is located in, in the, the center part of your home, so I'm sure working with acrylics is also safer environmentally yeah, right. speaking. The uh, fumes are less, and I'm sure it's healthier for me and, and the air quality of the air in the house. But, and then the cleanup so much easier. You, right. you clean all your brushes and tools with water, soap and mm -hmm. water. Uh, however, I've discovered that uh, there's been new developments in paint uh, varnishes and um, mediums in oil paints, right. they're odorless uh, thinners anymore, or mineral spirits. Right. But still, I prefer the acrylics. I like the rapid uh, drying and work, forcing me to work in a faster manner. So when you have your painting and it's, it's uh, um, gridded out like this, uh, do you work square by square or do you just work overall? Once you get the, the, the basics laid down, do you just work overall or I, I work overall. Generally, uh, quite often the case, I'll work from the upper left corner and work from left to right. In, in this case, my plan will be to block out or uh, fill in the sky, mm -hmm. which occurs from this from the horizon line upward, and then I'll do this grassy plain or this field of grass, dry grass, on the lower portion of the painting, and then proceed to do the outline in a darker color of the tree and the limbs and the, and the brush and the foreground. Right. So it's a layering process. Exactly. You work from the background to the foreground. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It keeps you from having to go back and redo things if you don't do it that way. Mm -hmm. That's what I tell my painting class all the time. And sometimes they listen. And I, I was, sometimes they listen, that's good. I'm, I was faced with a, a challenge here in that, how am I going to approach this? Am I just, sometimes I'll do a complete wash of color or a field of color all the way across. In doing so, I would eliminate the, the pencil work underneath. So what I will do is with a brush, I will cut in around the tree trunk and the limbs. Uh, the reason being because there's a strong light uh, on the tree limbs and trunk that would otherwise be covered in blue mm -hmm. and then I'd have to go back over with white paint and uh, I'm choosing to block out the color blue uh, cutting around the shape of the tree. Mm -hmm. I mean it, it's a little more tedious and time consuming right. but that's the way I like to work. Well do you ever work on tone canvases? What, which time? Do you ever work on a tone canvas? Do you ever like, uh, rather than start on a white canvas, do you ever tone it, you know, I don't know, like a, like a blue color, just the entire canvas? Yes, yeah, I've done that on occasion. But mostly I work with an off-white uh, base or foundation. Great. Let's take a look at some of your older work that's hanging up in your gallery now. Oh, okay. Drivers face all kinds of distractions. Before your wireless phone becomes one of them, stop. 
drive safely. Keep your phone in easy reach and dial sensibly. In bad weather or traffic, call later and use a hands-free device. Remember, with wireless, safety is your call. Keith, behind this are one of your newest paintings and uh, one of your older paintings. Uh, let's talk about your old painting first. Uh, about how far back does this painting take us? Uh, I started this painting while I was in college and that would have been uh, about 1980, 1979. Mm -hmm. And at that time I took a photograph uh, on a sidewalk, on a slope, sloping street, beneath this hill and this mysterious structure. It was the palm tree that really captured my attention from the start. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the mystery of, of this structure, which is it's the McRae Hotel in Santa Cruz, California. And uh, I, I view the, the palm itself, the foliage, like a star, a burst of fireworks. That's how I see it. And as as I progressed through the painting, uh, it, it began as an oil painting and then I started introducing acrylics. For instance, the green grass uh, and the blue sky is acrylic. The remainder of the painting is oils. Interesting. Yeah. You don't find too many artists that mix the, uh, the mediums like that. I thought with the acrylics I could get a nice uh, continuous tone of blue, mm -hmm. whereas I might not, not achieve that with the oils. So I'm going to guess you probably use the same process of the gridding yes. for this. Yes, I did. And, and working obviously from your own photographs as well. Right. So it's interesting because behind me on, on this wall is one of your more recent paintings and uh, it's interesting to see the similarities and, and uh, the style, the, the, the brush mark mm -hmm. and so forth and even in the, the way that you apply the paints has, has been the same. Uh, do you want to talk a little about your transition from, from your older style to your newer style? Well, uh, this particular piece uh, reflects my interest in what I consider art labels. Uh, this is a, a canned product, Great Northern Beans, but it, it was the name Glory Foods and the colors, the, the rays of orange and red, uh, the yellow and purple or violet being complementary uh, just just really caught my attention but I've been collecting uh, fruit and vegetable labels for a long time I've had a you might consider it a strange fascination or odd fascination with labels but I think of it I, I look at that and I think that's a beautiful piece of art on that label and of course the the label itself is a photograph of a spoon and a bowl of beans mm -hmm. I've, I've translated it into a painting and I've, I've omitted uh, some items from the picture, but uh, basically it's a recreation of a, of, of a, a label of canned goods. It kind of reminds me of uh, Andy Warhol's uh, pop art hmm. movement. Um, who are some of the artists that you look at and admire? Boy, that's a good... Uh, there's a fellow out west, Wayne, and I can never pronounce his last name, Theo, Theobald. Um, oh, he, Wayne Thibault. Thibault. Yeah, he's uh, Wayne Thibault. He's he's quite uh, well known for depicting desserts mm -hmm. like cakes and cupcakes and foods of that nature right. and street scenes and I and I also like uh, Edward Hopper. I like his work. Uh, it's very pictorial. The picture that he, or, or the the art he creates tells a story. Mm -hmm. It's descriptive. It generally includes a lone figure in a room or 
uh, Nighthawks is one of his popular right. paintings of a of a diner with a large uh, picture window and and some some lone figures seated at tables. And yeah, I, I see what you mean because I think you you share a, a, a similar sense of um, of that. I can see that isolation sense, loneliness, uh, and but I think more so the sense of light in your work is mm -hmm. similar to Edward Hopper's as well. Yes, I uh, I'm very much involved or interested in contrast, uh, sharp mm -hmm. contrast, shadows, light and dark, and reflective surfaces. I don't have any samples here to show you, but I've done a lot of automobiles and motorcycles with the re reflection on the chrome, right. uh, that, that, that that really intrigues me as well. Uh, Keith, working with labels and so forth in your new series of paintings, uh, do you find any copyright infringement um, aspects of this? I, I have definitely considered that, and uh, because of that consideration, I, I would not offer a piece like this for sale unless uh, I was sure to contact Glory Foods in this case and, and get their written or, or you know verbal permission to go ahead and reproduce this image uh, for, for resale. Uh, I have, it's either a trademark or a copyright issue and I'm not sure which, but I know, uh, I, I think I'm s stepping on somebody's toes to recreate this and sell it for profit, so I'm, I'm not going to sell the piece but until I get that permission. Right. Um, I was wondering about uh, if you had just changed the name of Glory Foods to, to your own made-up name. I wonder if that would make a difference. In I, I, to sell. I would imagine it, it would, and I've even received uh, suggestions to that effect. I've had folks in the gallery who've seen this piece and said, you know, to get around this issue, maybe you could create your own labels. You know, it could be any name you desire and, and a picture of the product, and which might very well be a, a good direction for me to go in. Then I, there's no copyright or right. trademark uh, issues involved. Well, that's a great idea. Yeah. Maybe we'll see how this goes in the next few years when we come back, of course. Yeah. All right, let's go look at some of your other work. Okay. On this back wall, we have one of your watercolors, and I think that you said that was your medium of choice yes. currently. Yes. So tell us a little bit about your uh, your watercolor behind this and, and the style that you're using. Well, again, uh, it's about light and shadow. Uh, I was really focused on the bright white of the petals in contrast to the deep shadow of the mm -hmm. earth and the, and the grass beneath it. Uh, I've even, to the point, simplified these flowers. There's not a tremendous amount of detail in them. I, I was bl They're more of a white shape against the darker color beneath them. Uh, in this particular painting, I've used a liquid uh, masket material that I've brushed in and then washed color over and, and then peeled this masket, liquid uh, masket up, revealing the, the blades of grass in this case. Mm -hmm. So I, I've used that uh, as a tool or device in a lot of my watercolor paintings. Well, it's interesting. You have uh, uh, so little detail in the dogwoods, which actually adds to the contrast mm -hmm. to that. Uh, right. you, you see so much value in there against uh, the dark, the dark greens of the grass and the dark browns of of this surface back here. It just really makes those dogwoods mm -hmm. pop right out. Now, this was uh, uh, taken from your, your own camera as well, this image. That's right. I, in April, uh, two or three years back, I took a picture of my neighbor's dogwood tree. Mm -hmm. This In this particular case, it's a lower limb extended out over the grass, and there's the bit planting bed that the tree is located in. Uh, I happen to pick this particular piece because I think it's a strong composition. You've got the tree limb coming in on a diagonal sh with uh, some movement here, and then this uh, oval or circular rounded shape dividing the earth or this uh, compost and, and the grass, creating a, a shape beneath the uh, flower petals. So I think uh, visually, it's, it's a strong piece and compositionally as well. It is, it's very <coughs> strong. Uh, so I'm assuming that you use the grid system if we were talking earlier. And, yes, and I did, I did. And uh, um, 
I, I believe that this came from a larger photo, and I, I, could, I cropped out a small area from a larger uh, photo till I, till I got just what I wanted. And of course, uh, being along the Dogwood Trail uh, at, at this location, right. this was the house we formerly lived in, and here as well, uh, I thought to, I'd start painting dogwood blossoms because it's a popular uh, tree and flower here in, the, in western Kentucky. It's a state flower too, I believe, dogwoods. No, oh, I didn't know that. So I'm assuming you have a lot of dogwood images. Yes, I do. I have uh, quite a few stored, uh, both the pink variety and the white uh, dogwoods. Mm -hmm. I've done a smaller uh, painting, which I've sold of a of a close-up of a pink dogwood flower, um, with the the backdrop being the leaves and foliage, right. and it, it was a strong piece as well. That's great. I bet you sell a lot of these works. These are very beautiful. Well, thank you. All right, let's take a look at some of your other landscapes. Okay. There are two paths a child can take. For over 25 years, we've been helping children choose the right one. Communities and schools, helping kids stay in school and prepare for life. We didn't have much to give then. A thin crop left us with hardly enough apples to fill the stand. So when they showed up firing them mean looks around the place and staring us down on prices, well, I was, I was angry. Didn't seem to bother my father, though. He let them set a fair price, or too low, I thought. that I would have done. He had me load another bushel of apples in their trunk. I learned later on that this family was in need. We did the right thing that day. The greatest gift we give It's in our heart what we believe The way we live Caring for others. Pass it on. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. Keith, right in front of us is uh, you're painting uh, fall reflections, uh, and this is done in acrylics as well. Can you tell us a little bit about your ideas on this painting? I can do that. Uh, what I've got here is a panoramic view of Smith Bay at Land Between the Lakes. Uh, again, this is uh, the direction I'm going in is to recreate landscapes of, of the western Kentucky region. Uh, I chose to stand in one spot and I took a series of photographs and spliced them together and keeping that in mind when I started this I was going to do a long narrow painting I thought why not break the painting up into individual panels much like the individual photographs that, that this image uh, started from. So this is four panels what's that called? Well uh, for lack of any other word I call it a quad tick. Uh, a two panels, of course, is a diptych, and three panels is a triptych. I call this a quad tick, or 
uh, a double dip tick, if you will. I like that. <laughs> Your own terminology. Yeah. So I, I, maybe I've set a precedent. I don't know if a four panel painting has been done before or not. And I certainly am not aware of any, but uh, this right here is the back of the bay. To me, this, uh, this is the focal point of the painting. And I put a land mass or a, a, a lake shore on either corner on each end to frame this piece and another device to, to uh, bring this whole painting together is the tree limbs in the upper right corner and, and the uh, foliage here on the left. I think it frames this piece uh, well. It does. It, it, and certainly the, when you're close up to it and you stand in the middle, it, it certainly covers your peripheral vision in a sense and, and pulls, the, pulls the viewer in. Um, this is an acrylic painting as well. And what's really interesting is that we were talking earlier about you doing a Van Gogh study. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was off camera, uh, but we were talking about doing a Van Gogh study. And I see some of Van Gogh's brush marks, similar to what he was using in there. Uh, was that a conscious effort? Not, not, no it wasn't, not at the time, but I can see, I can see it now that I'm completed with the piece. Uh, there are a lot of repetitious brush strokes, which uh, reminds me of Van Gogh. Uh, I've always been fascinated with reflective surfaces, and in this case, the, the surface of the lake. And although it's reflective, especially here where the trees are, the fall trees are located, uh, there's a lot of movement and activity, and I, I depicted that with the small brush strokes, especially in these three panels to the right. You've got some of the, the contrast we talked about earlier. You're using some heavier values, and certainly it's you know, obvious, and, and each end of the painting, I think, is really obvious. And I can see areas of heavy contrast, and you kept that consistency mm -hmm. as well, <clears throat> excuse me, in your painting. Uh, what, what's next? What's going to be the next piece on your easel? Well, of course, the canvas on the easel in the studio uh, is my next piece. And again, it's a, it's a landscape of, of land between the lakes here in Kentucky. Uh, I'm hoping to... Uh, to, to get away from the uh, photorealism that I've, I've come to enjoy and, and uh, duplicate to uh, free up my painting style in a more impressionistic manner, uh, to, to do more of, of this sort of loose and right. free uh, brush stroke work. Uh, I think that's the direction I'm headed in. Any more diptychs or double diptychs? Uh, there very well might be uh, more of those in my future. Great. Well, we'll um, see. Yeah, we'll see. We'll uh, we'll come back and, and visit in, Good. In, in a year or so and see what's going on. All right. I, I look forward to that. Well, thanks a lot, Keith, for having us. You're Appreciate welcome. it. All right. And that wraps up another edition of Eye on Arts. I'm your host, Randy Simmons. You guys will have to check us out next time. See here, this is his here's a lizard and crimson. That's a tough color to work with. That's right up in there. You, you with me?